Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Page Turners Plus. As usual, we do thank you for tuning in and watching our programs, and we do encourage you to follow us on social media, Page Turners Plus on Facebook and YouTube. Today, we'll be reviewing What a Mother's Love Don't Teach You by Sharma Taylor. It is her debut novel, which will be released on July 7th, 2022. And to tell you a bit more about Sharma Taylor and the novel, we have Kesua. Sharma Taylor is an award-winning short story writer and a novelist who hails from Jamaica. Her debut novel, What a Mother's Love Don't Teach You, just came out this week. The story follows Jamaican housemaid Dinah, who at 18 years old gave away her baby son to the rich and childless American couple she worked for, for before they left Jamaica. They never returned and she never forgot him. 18 years later, a young man comes from the US to Kingston. From the moment she sees him, Dinah never doubts this is her son. And this encounter sets off a chain of events that ripple with love and violence, shaking their lives and their lives in the community around them, making everyone question what they know and where they belong. A powerful story of belonging, identity and inheritance set in 1980s Jamaica, what a lo mother's love don't teach you brings together a blazing chorus of voices to evoke Jamaica's ghetto, dance halls, criminal underworld and corrupt politics at the beating heart of which is a mother's unshakable love for her son. It's not just about the ghetto, though. With this novel, Sharma Taylor paints a world of extremes of poverty and wealth where people jostle against each other for space, power, and they all claim to be, Jama to be acting in Jamaica's best interests while doing awful things to other Jamaicans. What a Mother's Love is a gripping page turner. We look forward to talking about it with you. Thank you very much, Kasua. So to, to get the ball rolling, really, the novel begins with a historical note and what is called a wise ruling from Solomon. Um, how important are these to the novel itself? Eric? Thank you, RJ, and uh, good day to everyone watching us. We thank you for your viewership. Yes, the, the, the beginning of the novel, uh, Sean Mattela rehearses the, the story um, of Solomon and and the two women with the babies. Um, and with one baby dying, uh, uh, the, the other mother takes the living baby and there's a whole um, controversy about that. Uh, we, 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 those of us Christians or Jews, whatever, would, would know the story. But yeah, it, it does set up, I think, the, the entire tension in the novel itself, a struggle uh, a struggle almost almost to the death um, between two women and one son. So it, it's in, I found it interesting that that she set it up that way uh, with, with this with this familiar Bible story that will take us through the heart of the the novel. And and then I, I suppose also in terms of the historical note where she she sort of sets the background for the development of garrison communities in Jamaica. And then we find out that the, the the whole story takes place in a garrison community, Lazarus Gardens. So, is this portrayal of garrison communities realistic? And does she, you know, sufficiently establish the link between garrison communities and crime? Um, this is thrown out to anyone, but I see Paula smiling. <laughs> I cannot say whether the portrayal of a garrison community is realistic. I've never lived in a garrison community. It looks like <laughs> it looks like what I've read about, um, <laughs> but um, as the novel, as the novel, the point one of the no, the points the novel makes is how separate um, Jamaican communities are. We have a it's a highly stratified society in terms of class. So I was born middle class Jamaican. I would have no clue what a garrison what life is like in a garrison community. I don't think I know it much better than the rest of you, to be honest. I, I, I know where to find them physically. And the legal district happens to be in surrounded by garrison communities. So I have that kind of knowledge. But I certainly don't have, like I said, I don't think I, in, a, in real terms, I know much more than you do. But then I, I assume Sharma Taylor probably um, wrote the novel knowing that 99% of her readers wouldn't know, exactly know what happens in a garrison community and that it, it would be based on what we've read or seen on the television 
or heard from other people. Um, so I guess it, it, it is sort of difficult to, to establish what life is really like in a garrison community outside of what we've read. Um, I did have, I did wonder about that though. Um, one of the things I found hard to, to comprehend was, for example, the diner who is one of the protagonists. Um, she's one of the mothers in this story. She's, when she welcomes Apollo, the son, she lavishes food on him. Now, this is a woman who has just lost a job. She is working two days a week as a housekeeper. And she never seems to have any difficulty. She never seems to have any worry about food security. Um, that was, a, for me, a disconnect. I would imagine that if you live in a garrison community, you are underemployed, seriously underemployed. I don't know how she was finding money to um, give, to create these lavish feasts for, for Apollo. Um, granted, it was poor people's food, but it seemed, the descriptions, it was a lot of food. So, so I, I just, that was a disconnect for me. Is that perhaps, if I can just jump in there, is that perhaps an incoherence in the story? Because when we think about another character, Regina, she talks about hunger being a part of life. And that doesn't seem to, the case, to be the case for Dinah. Is it because of where she works? Does she have access to food or she has access to cash to buy food? Is there something about the ages of the different characters that mean that while Regina has, has hunger as a, a real driving force for a lot of her activity, um, that isn't the case for Dinah? Is it because she's connected to the church? I don't know. I'm posing the questions. I guess you could fill in the blanks that way. <laughs> um, that, that's, that's, what I'm think, that's what I'm thinking. You know, we're, I guess we're meant to fill in the blanks um, there to figure out how Dinah was able to live comfortably enough in a garrison community. Granted, of course, um, I suppose not everyone in a garrison community would, would you know, be indigent. Um, Eric? Uh, that's a good point. And... I think while reading the, the text, I think my mind did go there. Um, but uh, Dinah, what, middle aged, maybe, I don't know. It, it, it's, it was hard to tell how old she was or how old she is in the novel. Maybe in her early 40s, I don't know, because she still had dudes checking her out. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but she also had a mother there. I mean, I don't, I don't know the system about food and and um you know here in the united states you can you, you got a you got an ebt card and you can go and get food you got food stamps and that sort of thing for uh for folk who are living under the poverty line or at the poverty line <clears throat> but um i know my grandmother my grandmother had government assistance when i was when i was a kid and grandma always had food in the house plus plus my aunt my auntie worked um so I, I didn't. It, it wasn't so much of a stretch for me, and I, I think going back to the the the, the point about um, these garrison communities. Number one, it made me think about uh, Kai Miller's August Town. In fact, August Town is actually mentioned in this novel. Uh, that's number one. So, like others, we 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 we've had a literary reference to um, these garrison communities. And second of all. Um, being being from a housing project myself, even though I didn't grow up in the housing project, I was a little baby in the housing project and a little boy. But that, those those garrison communities reminded me of the housing projects in in um, here, here in the United States, which where I grew up were totally uh, African American communities and uh, very little policing and. Basically, the, the projects police themselves. I wanted to mention, though, that um, Gina actually mentioned, you, you said about, you spoke about government assistance, and Gina addressed that. Gina said when Apollo, when she spoke with Apollo, and I, I think it was Apollo who told her about poverty, what poverty looks like in the United States, even though he was wealthy himself. She said, what I gathered from what Apollo t told me, is that poor in the United States is not the same as poor in Jamaica. Because you certainly cannot go to the supermarket and get a trolley full of food. 
Um, so, yeah. Uh, but then, I guess if we could speculate further and say, all right, it's a, it's a garrison community, maybe the dons provide food um, or, or access to food. Because actually, that is one of the things, like I said, I read just like you, I, I don't know personally, but that's one of the things that I've read, that the dons will provide you with the basic necessities of life. So that, that I guess could be one of the solutions. That's actually one of the questions that I had because the Don in this case, when speaking with, I think the, the um, police commissioner, assistant commissioner, said something about, you know, he looks after his people and just based on the descriptions of the way that his people were living, it seemed like there was a real disconnect for me. He's claiming that he looks after the people in the community, but yet we can see that they were really, really, you know, poor. And so to me, that was a real disconnect. And I definitely don't think there was anything like government assistance, certainly not back in the 80s. I was actually really surprised in that context where he describes himself as looking after the community, the way that he, I don't know what the right word is, but what he does to 13 year old girls. <laughs> You know, that there's a sense that he owns the women uh, in the community. I was like, wow, that's that's kind of crazy. And it, it just seems like such a legacy of enslavement, right? It just feels like such a, what kind of freedom is that? Where like you don't have any kind of bodily autonomy, so much so that you run off to some older man for safety and and well-keeping, you know? Like it was, it was, it was a real picture of, of deprivation that really shocked me actually, um, yeah. That, that I don't find shocking because, quite frankly, that is something I have seen. And not just in Jamaica. I've seen that here too. So, yeah, it, it happens. And, and speaking of, you know, deprivation, especially in, in Lazarus Gardens and, and so on, um, do we get the impression that with Dinah and Gina um, being um, relatively poor, being poor, that Apollo has some moral obligation to give them money. As we as we learn throughout the novel, you know, he starts giving them money and taking care of um, the, his people in the in the garrison community. So, do we think that there's a moral obligation on his part to take care of these people? That's a tough question because uh, I think I think more obligation in 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 this, in this particular context has to do with relationship. This this brother didn't have no relationship with nobody. Until until he pops up there, um, and Dinah makes this revelation that causes all of the the row and and, and the trouble. Um, I felt this that part of the story. Ah, uh, uh, how, how can I describe it? I, I, it was it was a, it, it, it was a bit unsettling for me. Um, I, I I thought he should have. I, I thought the author should have made him. A little bit more conscientious about what he was getting into and what, what he was saying, because what that that sort of that sort of posturing comes off as paternalist in 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 in, in my mind. I don't know what everybody else thinks about this, but I, I felt that this young man just graduated from high school. He's a, he's a black man, but raised in a with, with a white father, stepfather, black mother. Um, all this wealth and privilege that he's coming to Jamaica with his his hood on, is his superhero, what we would call today white saviorhood, except he's black. So I, I felt like uh, he's he's pressing too hard here. I I I know that we're all nodding away, but I'm going to jump in and say I felt similarly uncomfortable with that um, because I think it turned what should have been a natural relationship between young people into something quite transactional. And it spoke much more about their relationship with power and money in that community than it did about real human connection. Um, because like you said, he was clearly a little bit lost and looking for something in them. So it wasn't a completely, there was, it's not like there was no exchange happening. It was a very strange kind of thing. I also didn't find that normal or healthy perhaps is probably a better word yeah i agree because i thought that initially when apollo especially when apollo and damien met and they had a connection and they were hanging out i thought that was that was pretty cool right the way that they connected and they were hanging out two teenage boys talking about music and that kind of stuff 
And then it kind of morphed into this transactional relationship, as you said, Kesua. And I, yeah, I thought that was probably, that was, that was quite odd. Just to, just to add before you get in here, Paula, um, I think it was the, the second time that he met um, Dinah. Um, and this happened in Lazarus Gardens. I'm not trying to give away too much. I remember there was a, there was a, part where he you know stuffed cash into her hands without her even asking she didn't ask for that or anything he just decided oh i'm going to stuff um us dollars into her hands which i found really strange because um i mean i I guess going into a garrison community you could see that there's deprivation there's poverty etc but this is a an 18 year old boy um coming from the united states who you know must be a bit naive um ignorant even so i don't know why he decided that it would be completely fine for him to just push cash into her hands just like that that was a bit strange yeah it almost it set up a complex immediately that was yeah unsavory dino refused the money at that time but then later dino suggests that he has a sort he has some kind of moral obligation to help regina um so I, I think all of this, to be honest, is coming from a place of middle class guilt. And it's also coming from a place of Judeo-Christian um, teachings about what people who are more, <clears throat> are, are more privileged or the rest of the community. I, think, I honestly think that that is where it comes from. I, I think it comes from the author. That that's my, that's how I read it. That would make sense as to why it doesn't feel natural in the novel, then, because it does feel like it kind of happens and it changes things that would up, like it changes relationships in a way that don't feel organic. So thanks for that, Paul. Actually, that makes a bit of sense. Yeah, I, I really struggled with Apollo as a character in in, in, in the entirety of, of, of the text, uh, and I was I, I I gave him a lot of grace. I gave him a lot of grace and I felt that there was some, some admirable things that they thought of that he thought through some things. I felt at times he was, he was quite courageous, but um, I think what Rajay just mentioned, uh, his, his, his naivete was something that was glaring and uh, some, there were some blind spots and ignorance. And again, I, I, I didn't want to judge him from, my 21st century position. I didn't want to judge him from my own intellectual uh, 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 thinking about Caribbean life from an African-American perspective. I try not to do that. Um, But still, he came off to me as a a do-gooder without the, the capital the social capital to do it. Emily, yeah, can you say absolutely. a bit more? Like, what do you mean by that? Or maybe Francine, you got it. So, explain, explain um, what you mean. Well, I don't know if I'm going to explain what Eric meant, but I, I do agree to some extent because when you think of the fact, some of the place, the, the restaurant that he was taking her to, right? If you understood the social dynamics, you wouldn't do that. So, yeah, he was. He was, but again, he was young, right? He just graduated high school. He'd lived a fairly sheltered life, so he's—I'm guessing—he's never had to think any any of these things through, right? You 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 like a, you know you you like a girl. You want to take her out. Yeah, you go take her to a fancy restaurant. That's that's what he's used to doing, and he didn't actually think that, huh? Maybe we sh- I should not actually continue what i'm used what i'm used to doing because he was just unaware and naive okay so i'm gonna jump in in apollo's defense because somebody has to speak up for this young man he's like been brought up black in a white of white spaces his family are, and and let's let's give apollo some space his mum is the only black woman i've ever heard of ever described in this way she's a black woman who marries a white man disappoints her black family and is cut off from them or seems to excel herself and with her white husband decides to travel through africa and the caribbean 
So what 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 what's going on here with this character, and how is she gonna pro- and how is she gonna produce a black young man who is comfortable in his own skin? She clearly doesn't. You know, Apollo's reaching when he gets to Jamaica to find some kind of sense of who he is among black people. Fails, succeeds, fails, succeeds. Um, and so I think Apollo reminds me of a lot of young people that I've met, or older actually black people I've met, who've grown up around white people and are very uncomfortable in their own skin as a result of it. I don't think I've really met black people either adopted by white people or just grew up around white people who aren't damaged in some way from it. And I think Apollo is very well drawn in that way. I think he, I, I recognize that character. But Kesawa, you mentioned that this, um, that Celeste um, travels around Africa and the Caribbean with her husband. I think you're making a leap there because the, ju- the, the novel certainly blurs the lines between who was traveling around Africa and the Caribbean. I don't know that we can be so certain that it was Celeste traveling around the Africa and the Caribbean with her white husband. In fact, my view, my take on it is that it was not Celeste who was traveling around Africa and the Caribbean with her white husband. Yeah, and I agree with you, Paula. In my view, that was not Celeste either what, 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 what? i need more information okay so no, no. well we have to be careful how we talk about yeah. it because we don't just spoil it for other readers okay. in fact that's that was one of the things i liked best about the novel that it blurred the lines that you weren't quite sure who was doing what um and i don't want to spoil that for other readers um let them let them read it and, and see for themselves i had the same okay. thought myself so um yeah I, I'm, I'm i ain't saying nothing did we all read this book differently but i think that's a real strength of the novel right that they're like there are layers to it there are it, I, like i asked the question is anybody a reliable narrator in the story because you think this happened and then it seems like it didn't quite happen like that and then this happened but actually someone else tells a slightly different version of that story and it's wonderful storytelling in that sense i have to say yeah, that's and, and, and I, I agree. And I mean, when I when I finished reading it, I had I put in my notes lots of unanswered questions, and I think that's it. These, these different narratives, these voices. People remember what they people remember what they remember. People remember what they want to remember. We all do this. We all tell different versions of the sa- of a story. Two or three people could be sitting around the same time, and the story is happening. I I see it this way. Somebody else sees it that way. Another person see it this way. I think that's natural for us, and I think that's what she's doing, what, what, what she's done in, the, in this novel. So, yeah, it leaves a lot of frayed edges, we might say. And it's natural that we would see that because we all see things from our perspectives, and we all bring our histories to to how we view things. I mean, I because we because we've had a, a little bit of banter before we started filming. I can see that all of us read this novel from our own backgrounds you know and and that that's how we view life we all think that our reality is everybody else's reality but it isn't it's just our reality (laughs) and and i i like the fact that the novel plays on that yeah absolutely i don't think think we necessarily don't think other people don't have a different version of reality but i take your point and this takes us to the time where we take a bit of Diner's perspective on reality, and we'll have a reading by Sharma Taylor. Hello, my name is Sharma Taylor, and I'm the author of What a Mother's Love Don't Teach You. And I'm super excited to be doing a reading for Paige Turner's Plus today. So this book is set in 1980s Jamaica and centers on a housemaid by the name of Dinah. And in this scene I'm going to read, Dinah is about to meet a boy who is going to change her life. Um, The setup is 18 years before, she'd given up her baby boy in an informal adoption to her uh, employers who are an expat American couple living in Jamaica at the time. So I'll just go into it. Dinah, you're making a mess. Mrs. Brown's voice, bring me back to right now and the black car parking. What's gotten into you today? May hear the people coming in but me not paying them no mind since me nowhere near finished all the things the Browns want me to cook. Is where the time gone? Mrs. Brown leave the kitchen, carrying the jug of Ota Eti apple juice me did make. 
She told me to follow her into the living room with a tray of glasses. Ray, great to see you again. I see Mr. Brown hugging a fat white man with brown hair like bird feathers. Celeste will be right inside. She left her glasses in the car. This must be Apollo. Mr. Brown in him element now, vigorously pumping an outstretched black hand. A tall, nutmeg-colored young man in gray jeans, blue t-shirt, and black and white sneakers walking. Him have thin, neat locks, light brown at the ends, tie up in a ponytail. We see the long eyelashes, the nose that take up almost half his face, the full mouth, the neck. I look at his wide shoulders. I let go the tree, right there on the terrazzo tiles. Time fall away and gone. I don't care about the shock on the brown's faces or about anyone else in the room. I say to the boy, son, son, are you? Is really you? Sorry, him say. Him is a boy in the body of a man, broad face, knobby head like Leroy own. Mr. Steele, I say to Mr. Steele, who looking at me now like him don't know me. Dad, the boy look at Mr. Steele too. Mr. Steele is the color of uncooked shrimp. What's she talking about? Mr. Steele, the same Mr. Steele with the floral shirts and crisp white pants talking now. Sorry, lady, but you're confusing me with someone else. We don't know you. It's me, Mr. Steele. Dinah. Dinah, shut up, Mr. Brown say. Shame fill up his face. I don't care what him think. Mr. Steele, you don't remember me? She hasn't been herself today, says Mrs. Brown. In my head, I scream. Don't offer no excuse to me, you son of a bitch. You're not, aid, me not aiding and abetting you to have criminal teeth and pick me again. I know my child, that son's son. My voice sounds strange, but I not underwater anymore. The drum exploding in my ears now. I grab Apollo's hands, stepping on glass that look like points of light glistening on the floor. His fingers like mama's, fingers that use sticks on drums to release spirits in the dark. Mr. Steele is barking now at Mr. Brown. Christopher, who is this woman? If you don't stop this madness right now, Dinah, I'm calling the police, Mrs. Brown scream. But I pull my son to me and rub him head. His hair still coarse, but no longer picky picky like when he was a baby. I like the sweet smell of his fuzzy hair. I kiss his mouth, the mouth that is like my mouth. He is a part of me that is outside myself. That's it, Mr. Brown shout. He and Mr. Steel hands are on me now, fingers digging into the folder trying to pry me off some tongue, but me too strong for them. The pandemonium bring Mrs. Steele from the car outside. She run in, her nostrils flaring, flaring like a bull about to buck. Take your hands off, my son, she yell and slam her body into mine, knocking over the coffee table. Me underground before me realize what happening. She pinned me to the floor. Then her husband dragged her off me, kicking and screaming. Dinah, Dinah, get out. Mrs. Brown is, is in hysterics, and I hear Mr. Brown, pitiful sounding, saying, Sorry about this, Ray. Him warm me now. Dinah, if you put one foot inside this yard again, I'll have you locked up for assault. Mr. Steele's white face, blood red. Sun son still standing there, body quiet like him feet in cement. I'm sorry, he says again. What's going on? No more sorries. You hear now, my son. I can't believe it's you, I say. Where I lock, I see me in him. Him embarrassed, I trying to take him back in the open. All right, I'll be patient, my son, I say under my breath. But I know him hear me. Only he can hear. The phone in the hall start to ring, adding to the madness. Make sure that neighbors hear the screams. Mr. Brown still throwing expletives like stones when me, pick, when me gather my bag and leave. I don't care what him say. Not about Mr. Steele's fake amnesia or about Mrs. Steele acting like she not Mrs. Steele. Now that her skin looks some shades darker. I need my child. I need my son's son. And I can't wait to get home to tell Mama to find him. Welcome back. That was a reading by the author herself, Shama Taylor. 
So just to sort of continue on from where we were before we took the reading, I guess I could ask the panel, you know, were any of the characters lovable in the story? Did you did you become attached to any of the characters? I see head shaking. <laughs> I mean, I, I would say I did become attached to Apollo because I wanted to see this this his the story played out. Um I mean, he was caught in a really, really, really tough situation. A couple of tough situations. Um, and I wanted to see how he was going to handle himself and how he's going to handle it, um, the, the, the situation. So I, w- I was invested in him. I would also say that I was invested in Damien as well. Um, again, uh, complex character. I think he's more complex than, than Apollo. Um, it would have been interesting if it's a story centered on him, but obviously. Um but yeah, I, w- I was invested in, in Damien. I-, I wanted to see him. I, w- I, w- I wanted to see him flourish. I wanted to see him flourish. Yeah, I liked Apollo too, and because she is a young woman, Gina, I was very anxious for Gina. Um, I liked Dinah as well. You know, I-, I thought I had some problems with how Dinah was portrayed. I thought Dinah was too without sin um i don't know that any of us is as forgiving and as well i guess she wasn't all that forgiving but i i found that dinah was a little bit too good to be true but i did feel compassion for dinah i don't think i loved any of the characters but i definitely was on team dinah the whole way through until i was like hold on am i is she What's going on? Um, but I still liked her all the way through, I will say. Um, what I will say also is Regina, I think Paula, you said it exactly right. Anxious for her. Like you want this woman, young woman to make it out, even though she seems a little bit cold blooded at points. Um, but you understand really that it's one of these characters where poverty has kind of misshapen your your kind of ability to connect with people. Um, and so it's interesting and, and quite lovely actually the difference that Apollo makes to her life. Um, I don't know, though, that I really loved any of the characters. Damien is a character I probably had the most affection for. Um, and it actually reminds me a lot of tone in um, uh, Sherry Jones's novel. Like, he really he brought really similar feelings and quite a similar story in some ways. Um, I mean, not the two novels, but the two characters have quite similar in some ways. Certainly where they end up as well, unfortunately. Um, yeah, but, but I don't think it's good that I liked him because he reminded me of Tone, who I absolutely adored. But I did, so here you are. I felt the whole book reminded me of Sherry Jones's book. Yeah, I definitely got vibes of, of how the one-armed sister sweeps her house. Um, I also didn't really love any of the characters. I definitely wanted Apollo to make it out, so to speak. Like, yeah, I was kind of anxious about what was going to happen especially given the plan that was made for him by British. So yeah, the, and also because I felt like he was caught up in all of this through really no fault of his own and coupled with, as we said, his complete naivety. Like I felt like he really deserved to make it out. So I definitely wanted him to, to survive, so to speak. Um, but I, honestly, I didn't have a lot of empathy for any of the other characters, not even Damien. Yeah, I, th- I, th- I think I could almost, you know, fully um, adopt Kesua's positions on, on the characters, um, especially with um, Regina. Uh, I think she was just a victim of her environment um, and not revealing too much. But some of, the, some of the actions she took, especially towards the end of the novel, you know, I think is just uh, a symptom of the life she's lived, the community she's grown up in. Uh, even her family, uh, as we find out in the, in the in the novel as well, so she she gets this mentality where a mentality of exploitation. That's all I'll say. Um, and and I mean, it's it's bad, but I don't think we could necessarily fault her for having it because she's just a, a victim of her environment, and especially the way um, she was treated by her family and um, was basically turned into an adult as a child. Um, so I think that in in on its own. Um, could be forgiven on my. I could be forgiven on, on of that. In terms of Eddie, though, <laughs> I haven't heard any mention of Eddie, but I, I like Eddie the character. I mean, I found that he deserved a, a, an entire chapter, probably two, 
uh, I needed a bit of backstory on Eddie. I, I just just the way he handled certain things throughout the story. I feel like he deserved a chapter or two. Kessel, Eddie, the taxi seen... driver. Yes, Eddie, the like, taxi driver. For a minute, I was like, "Who's Eddie?" Then I was like, <laughs> "Oh, Eddie." And and, and and that's the whole point. The fact that you were like, "Oh, who's Eddie?" I feel like he deserved a chapter. Eddie, Eddie was always showing up at the right time. Eddie, Eddie, Eddie was the eyes and the ears. Listen, Eddie knew everything going on. I didn't need to know anything more about Eddie. Eddie was there to earn his money driving his taxi, and that is what Eddie did. <laughs> End of story. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I liked Eddie. Eddie was just minding his business, making his money, and whatever happened. <laughs> I mean, Eddie was a snitch, right? <laughs> Let's be clear. I mean, not a police snitch, but like Eddie was the center of the drama as well in some ways, right? Lots of things don't happen if Eddie doesn't open his mouth, right? And so it's really interesting that you point out. I was like, "Who's Eddie?" And I was like, "Oh, yes." And I you said the word that. transactional earlier, Kesawa. No, Mister Eddie is all about the transaction. Another character we haven't talked about actually. I would love to hear people's thoughts on the characters of Davis and British. Because um, and and Sims, right? Sorry, more more characters, more characters, so many characters. But like, British was a real oddball for me. Like, I, like so he's supposed to be a sociopath. I get that, but then he's also quite thinking and clearly does feel quite deeply because he has this sense of inferiority that he's always trying to overcome. So how is he unfeeling? It yet constantly feels like he's in a battle of power with various people of the upper classes i found that really weird and also to keep the lower classes that he acts in their best interest but also ensures that have no kind of autonomy in the spaces that he controls so he was a real character dave's actions at the end really surprised me um i'm sure they surprised you but i'd love to hear anybody else is surprised and sims siaga what do we think without i feel without those three there wouldn't be a story um those three um, individuals, you know, while they might not necessarily be the protagonist or um, take up a huge chunk of the book, without Davis, British, and Sims, there would be no What a Mother's Love Don't Teach You. Um, yeah, yeah, they they were the ones with they were the ones with power. They were the three characters with the most power in the novel, even more than than Raymond. I mean, Raymond, yes, he had some power just because of who he was, but in terms of you know, having an effect on the lives of the people in Lazarus Gardens. It was those three who were who were wielding the power. Really interesting. I was quite surprised at what happened in the end with Davis. Wasn't sure whether to be like, what? Or be like, yeah, you go. But I, it was surprising. <laughs> um, Sims is Sim Siaga. I think Sims is just um, inspired by Siaga. I don't think he was... For example, he wasn't as much Siaga as um, Intiasar in This One Sky Day. This One Sky Day, it was no, there was no doubt in my mind that that was Siaga. Sims is, is just kind of remotely inspired by Siaga. That was how I read it. Yeah, the character British. Um, British, was, it, British was intriguing. Uh, uh, the, the whole thing about him going to, to, to England... And then the the racism that he experienced obviously you know, made him somewhat a little bit a character worthy of empathy, and and and, and the brother talked about it. And then he spent he spent some time in, in jail there. Um, yeah, I, I, that that was interesting the way that that Sean Mattela, uh layered him because he he's got he, he's got the experience of racism that we've all experienced. He he, he goes to the white man's country. Um, at least I, I, some of us have that experience, uh, being around the white man and, and, and the systems, uh, of, of whiteness, uh, and he survived, he goes back and then he, and then he, he finds his place in Lazarus gardens. Um, basically he's the next one coming up and had to do some unsavory things to, to become the top dog. So there's a lot of like crime drama involved in his story. I mean, again, he could have been his own story. Could have been his own story. It reminds me of uh, uh, some of these novels written by former judges, these crime dramas, like Carlito's Way and all that kind of stuff. But um, 
yeah, he's interesting dude. Uh, supercilious, clean freak. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Also kind of remind me a little bit of uh, New Jack City too. <laughs> mm. I I think one of the things I found odd about the novel actually um, is the timing of, of it because British is a deep, I'm not spoiling it when I say he's a deportee, right? So on the, on the one hand it springs, like, oh yeah, I've heard about deportations, Windrush, la la la. But it's like, but he's too early. He must be one of the first people to be deported. Um, <laughs> like, because that's not, that, that's very, it's a much later kind of phenomena. Um, politically than than this novel and it, I think that was the disjunction I, I, I struggled with a little bit like why is he because he's been deported and has become a crime boss right but it's mm. like it's 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 just too early for me but that's my historian going that doesn't make sense with the time no the, the, you, you're not the only one uh, I, I I felt the same thing about the timing and the period I was like oh, is this the 90s oh it's got to be the 80s and so yeah well we, we, we're two historians so uh, I feel you I guess I guess we could also jump a bit to um, speaking a bit about Mama the character and what that represents and how motherhood is treated um, in the story. So uh, I'll throw that out to the panel. What do you think of that? Mama is a seer. That's 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 how I take her. Mama is is almost a prophet, um, and she is she's this wise woman, and that's that is how that is how I see her. That Kesawa is why I do not believe Celeste was in Africa um, because I trust Mama's take on what is going on. What is real um, is what Mama says is real. That is, yep, that's it. I wasn't too sure actually about the role that Mama was playing. I, I honestly, that was one of the things like every time her section came up, I'm like, I don't get it. Like why, I, you know, I don't understand. But I, now that you said that, Paula, it's true that she said she was very clear from the very beginning. She was like, nope, this is not it, you know? And I was like, all right, <laughs> I think, I think I should go with what mama is saying. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I also read mama like the chorus in a, in a Shakespeare play, like he yeah. tells the story. Uh, she's yeah. the reliable narrator and the only reliable narrator. And ironi ironically, we don't understand that like the way the other characters understand who she is, but we mm. understand that as the reader. But Sharma plays with our heads too with Mama because remember that Mama has some mental health issues. So Sharma is tell she uh, Sharma is is tell suggesting to us really should you trust her so much? But I do. Um. <laughs> yeah, I, I I trust Mama as well. I mean, Mama. Yeah, Mama was firm in in some of her in, in her assertions about the past and even the present. And yeah, that the little the whole thread, we think, oh, you know, mama, mama's on her last leg. Mama, mama could go at any time. Mama, you know, goes on the escapade and we don't know where she is. And yeah, we they will say, okay, well no, we, we can't trust nothing this 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 old lady got to say. But um no for me I trust mama. And I think that ties into the other question about her motherhood, because she a mama too. You know, she a mama too. Is this not about Celeste and uh, uh, Dinah and, and their pitch battle, but also mama plays in the net too. What I also found witty was that Celeste was referring to her mother as mama. Or am I the only person who picked that up? Or oh, I thought that to be at first I yeah, found it confusing. I, I was I like, noticed hmm. that. Hmm. yeah. But then I realized that it might have been you know a very intentional thing for Celeste to be calling her mother mama. It as better mama. be intentional because that's what <laughs> that's what African Americans call their mamas. It's not mama. We don't we, we don't say mom, mummy. It's mama. Your mama. All them jokes. Your mama. This. <laughs> but in the Caribbean, we call our mothers mummy though. Um, that's because and that's really, it's a, it's a British thing. Yeah, it's a British well, thing. Well, it's well, a actually, British actually, thing. Actually, mm -hmm. my grandmother was always mama to my mum's generation, right? So their mother is, I guess, mum or mummy. No, that you yeah, no, that you say it. That's true. Yeah, that's my true. Gra my grandmother, yeah. mm -hmm. my, ma my mother's mum. Everybody called her mama. But for some, but in, but from my generation, all the kids called their mothers mummy. Mm -hmm. So when did the change happen in the sixties? Probably had to do with yeah with, with education, right? 
Because like my my parents and and their aunts and my aunts and uncles mm -hmm. would have been the first generation of my family that went beyond primary school. So it's probably yeah. because of that they went to secondary school. They read British literature where everybody calls their children mummy, and so we're calling our children we're calling them mummy. I'm thinking I'm just you know riffing here, but that might be it. Yeah, it might be. It might be. Yeah. So, I mean, as we're starting to come wind down to the end of the program, I guess I could ask a, a sort of overarching question, you know, what are your thoughts on how forgiveness is addressed in the, in the novel, if it is addressed at all? I, th I thought it was there, definitely. Um, there's, there's a space given for forgiveness. Uh, there's a lot of forgiveness that has to be done uh, because of all of the things that are happening in, 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 with, with, with the relationships. Ah, and I, 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 I felt it. I definitely felt it, and I thought it was appropriate. Um, again, I, I go back to my statement with with uh, Apollo and social capital. Um, not saying that you you we we have rights to f hold people to things. Um, the lack being being a lack uh, having lack lack of forgiveness, but. Uh, I don't know. That, 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 was, that was that was a big weight uh, for for some of the characters. Uh, Apollo, that was a big weight for him to carry. Um, Raymond, that was a big weight for him to carry as well because he's involved in, in in having to be a forgiving person. Um, yeah, uh, it's there, and I think I go back to Paula's point. Um, I think the author is is plugging her own values, which, which is fine. The, the author can do that. I mean, those values, I share those same values, but I, I think I think I would have liked it to be a little bit more nuanced. I'd agree with that. I feel like forgiveness is so important in this particular story. And I think I felt like it was actually handled relatively superficially. Forgiveness is so powerful. When you really forgive the kind of terrible things that need to be forgiven, like, you know, it changes people. It's, it's, it's not a, a small thing. And it kind of, I thought, Actually, it comes across as a small thing in this novel. It's a simple look of sorry here, I forgive you here, and it's done. And it's like that's not that's not real forgiveness for me. But yeah, I think I agree. I feel like I don't know the not just the forgiveness, but a lot of the way that the relationships developed between the characters just happened so quickly and so easily without any sort of development, you know. And yeah, I mean, but but there were some some things related to forgiveness that I think were not so hard. I think a lot of the characters in the book had to forgive their mothers, and I'm not sure that that happened, right? Because Damien, you know, he, I don't think he ever, un, he never understood or forgave her. Regina as well. There's a lot of, of things happening with the characters and their mothers where I feel like they hadn't gotten to the point of forgiveness. But for the specific incidents, in the novel, yeah, I feel like it all happened a bit too sweet, too easily, and you know, wrapped up a bit too neatly for my liking. Dinah, the Dinah forgiving Mama for for the way Mama raised her. I thought that was way too easy. She should have had a much more complex relationship with Mama. Um, so yeah, it, it, that didn't work for me. I I, I thought a lot more would have should have happened but then i i saw two instances of non-traditional um forgiveness or tradition or forgiveness in the non-traditional sense the first one for me would be uh, what i would call apollo apollo forgiven dinah or i don't want to spoil anything but Apollo in the sense that he's portrayed in the novel in Dinah's perspective, let me put it that way, forgives Dinah. Because here you have Dinah, you know, essentially giving away her, her, her baby. And there seems to be a sense of, well, that's okay. That's water under the bridge in terms of her relationship with Apollo. That's all I'll say. I'll try not to give any spoilers. The second instance for me is Apollo forgiven, uh, Regina at the start of their interaction when they first met because here's Apollo growing up in a privileged family um, going to a private school um, you know uh, and not seeing the world as it really is and then he essentially falls in love with Regina he's 
it, to me, he forgave all the things that are bad about her. He forgave, you know, that um, she does what she does. Um, uh, whatever. I'm not trying to spoil the thing again. But the things that she does in the garrison community, he to me, he forgives those. And he's like, you know, I still love you. That, that's all I'll say. So I think there are two instances of forgiveness in the novel. Um, I hope I, I didn't provide too many spoilers. Uh, no, I think there's more. <laughs> because I think there's a beautiful bit of forgiveness between Damien and um, Regina. Um, and, and that I think is really well done. And I think I'm thinking back to some of the things we've said in this conversation. I have to say, I wonder if we've treated, and perhaps it's the way the novel's written. It's not a YA novel, but it deals with very young people. And I think there has to be leniency and space for them to kind of not to be naive and to, and to not be fully fledged in some ways because they're still developing as people, right? That's why young people are interested in as characters. Um, because I think the way that they grow, Regina and that Damien is, is really well done. And also the relationship with Apollo towards the end when they all kind of come full circle. That's really lovely. And I think it's very well done actually. All right. That's, that's why I said in my reading, I, I had to give Apollo a lot of grace. I, I couldn't, I couldn't judge him as a 53 year old African-American historian man <laughs> well I, I guess we could also just ask for any final thoughts on the novel the the characters um uh well just just one very brief thought um i don't know Kesua. i really like the novel it was very poignant it was very vivid um it really painted a picture of a world that is not that familiar to me um mm. in re- and the, the way the characters intersect is we're really really well done um i i really enjoyed it well we don't have time for ratings but what i will say is that we're not finished with this book because we we do have a scheduled interview with the author and just as a reminder this is a debut novel that will be released or was released on the 7th of july uh 2022 and so you could get a copy to read it and understand all that we've been talking about. So the next time you've seen us, you'll be seeing us interviewing Sharma Taylor herself. Thank you once again for tuning in uh, to another episode of Page Turners Plus and do have a lovely day.